Um, all right. Well, hey, friends, welcome to TAP, which stands for Theology Automatic for the People. And we are pressing on in our justice series. And so, um, yeah, we're in week three this week, uh, which is um, which is fun. So uh, my name is Nika Spaulding. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the resident theologian at a church called St. Jude Oak Cliff here in Oak Cliff, Dallas, Texas. And so if you're in the area, I highly encourage you to come check us out. Um, and if you've been with me, hey, guys. Uh, so we are, like I said, we are jumping into week number three today, which is going to be all about justice and the law. And so that's what we're going to jump into. But as usual, uh, the way that we start every class, because we believe that the goal of all Christian instruction is ultimately worship, um, we begin every class the same way, which is trying to set our heart upon things of the Lord. And so for our worship this week, um, read Psalm 1. And it talks about, blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but instead he delights in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. And it goes on a couple more verses after that. But um, read that psalm, uh, and then consider how can you delight in the law of the Lord, uh, which is what we're encouraged to do. It's what, how the book of Psalms begins. It says, hey, this is what uh, it means to be in step with God is to delight in his law. So consider how you can do that and then spend some time doing that. However you decide this is what it looks like to delight in the law of the Lord, figure that out and then do that. Um, yeah, so that's how we're going to begin worship. So hit pause, jump in there, all that good stuff. Like I said, we're going to do justice in the law um, this week, and then we'll move into the prophets next, and then we'll look at justice in Jesus' time. Uh, but I'm really excited about this week's study. And this, I think this will end up being a little bit of an abbreviated lesson. Um, well, you know what? I shouldn't speak too soon. We'll find out. Um, okay, so first things first, though. In order for us to really understand the law, the law uh, is... It's interesting. The the first five books of the Bible are often called the Torah or instruction. And within those, there's narrative stories, which is what we looked at last week. These stories that reveal what God values, what he cares about, how God has moved throughout history on behalf of certain people. And then weaved in those passages are chunks of literature that we would call law. Um, They're these um, written codes, so to speak, of what it is that God requires of his people. And there are whole books of them, like the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus only has a little bit of narrative. There's parts about like Nadab and Abihu and other parts. Um, The book of Deuteronomy is an entire law book code-ish, but there's also a couple of things weaved in there as well. Um, And then within the narrative books, there's parts of those books that are law. For example, we see in the book of Exodus, it's very much a story of of God's rescue of his people out of Egypt and then establishing um, his tabernacle with them and who he is. But then within that, there's huge chunks of law, specifically from basically chapter 19 through 24 of Exodus is, is a lot of law code. And so that's what I mean by law. It's the passages of scripture where God is telling humanity, this is what I'm requiring of you. This is what it looks like to be my people. And here are the, the prohibitions and the, um, what's the, not the opposite of like, you can't do this, but you must do this. Whatever the other word of that would be. But anyways, it's what God is requiring of humanity, specifically of Israel, the people of God. Um, and so that's what we're looking at today. But but in order to do that, I really want, the law is, um, if you guys have ever, you know, started out and you're, you're like, okay, this is my year. I'm going to read through the whole Bible this year. And you get on a reading plan. Uh, no doubt, uh, Genesis, great. There's some weird stuff in it, but like cool story. Exodus, like, wow, the plagues, like awesome. 19 to 24 like it's a little odd but we get the 10 commandments it's fine and then you kind of get to the tabernacle and you're like "Ooh, it's a lot of instructions for a tent like just pop it together man and stick that thing in the wilderness right and so you kind of get to the end of exodus and you're like oh that was a lot of like detail and then leviticus comes and suddenly you're going this is my reading plan and then you see all these laws and some of them are weird right do not boil a goat in its mother's milk um do not, uh, you know, cut your hair in certain ways. No tattoos. It actually says that, although I don't think that's the equivalent of today's tattoos. But anyways, like there's some really weird stuff in the laws and the way it's written is kind of weird if you're not used to understanding the way ancient law codes work. So you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, then the book of Numbers, which also has like all these ton, like, t- uh, like really long genealogies. Although the book of Numbers is straight fire, gets a bad reputation. People should read that book more. There's some amazing stories in there. But let's say you finally get to Numbers, you survive the genealogies, then you get to Deuteronomy, and you're like, 
this law again? Like, I will be the first to admit the law gets a bad rap. It's hard to understand. And so there are plenty of times that we just don't spend a lot of time reading them. And they can often be weaponized. Um, they're, they're the places where people can go chapter and verse and say, this is why your behavior is wrong. Um, even if that verse is embedded in a paragraph and we don't understand the paragraph, we'll take that one verse and hammer that home. For example, the tattoo one, right? Um, so that being said, I wanted to set a little bit of the ground rules. I will not be able to address every weird thing that's in the book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, whatever. There's, and there's plenty of passages. There, there are laws that I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that means. And we'll address that at the end. And so I just want to give that disclaimer. But I wanted to first say, okay, this is kind of how you read law. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do first. Okay, so lawsome. Uh, okay, so first of all, the law is both regulatory and revelatory. If you've been in classes with me, you have probably heard me say this because I think it's a really good catchphrase. It's regulatory and that it does regulate behavior. This is the expected behavior, the practices, the prohibitions, what is required of you. It is regulatory. This, it is a game plan. This is the behavior of God's people. It is also revelatory and that it reveals who God is. <coughs> Excuse me, y'all. I was outside most of the day today. Oh. So I need some allergy meds, but my roommate, Alex, who y'all know, went to the, uh, she's out of town this weekend with her parents and she took the dog with her and the dog and I share the same allergy meds. And so I didn't have an allergy pill today because Corey, the dog has my allergy meds. I mean, technically they're hers. I just steal from her, but she doesn't know cause she's a dog. So anyways, the law is both regulatory and revelatory and that it reveals who God is. There is a God behind these laws and so it is going to show you what he's like what he values all that good stuff and we'll talk about this a little bit more and how that plays out so again regulatory there are festivals right so there's a way that god expects worship to take place there are certain events in israel's history like the exodus like certain feasts like certain times a year that he's saying this is how i want you to order your life that certain days are more important than others in the life of the calendar, right? So there's festivals. There is also sacrifices that are given. Sacrifices are given when you've sinned. Sacrifices are given when you haven't sinned, but for other reasons, offerings, things like that. Um, there are behavioral expectations. Do not covet. Uh, do not lust. Do not, well, um, like, do not desire your neighbor's wife or what, like, uh, do not commit adultery. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Do not boil a goat in its mother's milk, right? There are these behavioral expectations that are also in these regulatory places. Uh, what's the house of worship got to look like? So those tabernacle sections in the book of Exodus, those are law codes. What is the tent going to look like? How many units of measurement is it going to be? Where are you going to put the showbread? What do the priests need to dress like when they're doing these special religious sacrifices? What do the people need to be doing? All that. So it is regulatory. It is extensive. It is very extensive, which tells you God has a very strong opinion about how his people should behave, right? He's got a very strong opinion about the way in which you worship him and the way in which you treat each other and the way in which you approach him when you've done wrong and the way that you approach others when you've done them wrong. So the, there is a lot of regulation in these passages. It is expected that the people of God behave a certain way and God has a lot to say about that behavior down to their holidays, um, which, hold on. If you think about holy days in the Christian calendar, so you've got Pentecost, but I don't feel like we do enough for that. I think we should have more Pentecost parties. We obviously have Easter, huge, huge, huge day. We obviously have like basically the month of Christmas. We have Advent leading up to it and then Christmas Day. Sorry, Mark, Christmas is not before Christmas Day. We have Advent and all that. So it's not that we don't have it, but there's something really profoundly beautiful about the the festivals in the Bible and the, like the Feast of Booths. Um, Passover, uh, the Day of Atonement. Um, like, I just think we should reclaim some of those. I, I just think it's a really beautiful thing. Or at least we should maybe take Pentecost and make it a bigger deal. Like, add that into our repertoire. That's what I think. 
you know, I'm sure there's parts of the Christian tradition who do. So maybe this is just me pitching to St. Jude that we should have more parties. That's ultimately what I'm saying. Okay. So it's regulatory. It is also revelatory. You can see from the laws, what does God value? Okay. And so I'm going to ju- like jump the shark here and just tell you like relationships are really important when relationships are broken. He has not only, he tells you not only don't do that, but then he tells you how to restore it. He also tells you who does God value? And the answer is, of course, always everyone, but there's special considerations made. Also, it talks about what does God really value? What are the things that come up over and over and over again? There's certain laws that you're like, that's weird, and you heard it once. And then there are other laws where he really expands on what he means by that. What do I mean when I say don't do this? So rather than a one-off of like, oh, don't kick the neighbor's cat off your porch and you might mention that once that's not an actual law it's not in the bible but if he's like seriously don't burn their house down please don't burn their house down do not even light a match near their house get the kerosene away from their house right if you see a law repeated if you see an idea repeated if someone repeats something if a teacher repeats something when something is repeated you see what i'm doing here it means it's really important so uh i had this one professor in seminary and I got literally hundreds on my tests with him. And I know that that sounds like a brag, but here's, I mean, it, I mean, it is, there's no way around that, but, but here's how I got a hundred. And my friends literally, I, I cannot believe that it took them one test to figure this out because they got fine grades, but they didn't get a hundred. And they were like, how'd you get a hundred? You don't even take that many notes. He would literally teach the class and he'd be like, yeah, so um, God's will is revealed in the scriptures. The scriptures are really important. Psalm 119 is really important. Psalm 119 is really important. Psalm 119 is really important. Psalm 119, I kid y'all not, he would repeat things five to seven times. And I just used a pencil and a, and a, like a little spiral notebook and anything that he repeated more than three times, I just literally wrote that down. And then when the test came around, I just... I literally just studied that notebook of all the things that he repeated. And guess what was on the test? The things he repeated. It was like, and when I told that to my friend, they're like, seriously, how would you get 100? And I told them this. They were like, that's it? And I was like, yeah, you guys are way working too hard. Okay. That's not to say the other things aren't important. (laughs) It is to say, though, teachers, and God is the preeminent teacher, repeat the things that are really important. So as you're reading through the law, even if you can't understand it, grab a binder, write down the laws of God, and then put check marks when he repeats them. If you start noticing a lot of check marks, that's something that probably matters to God. All right, so that's the revelatory. How does this show you? So I'm going to make the connection for you to see how the revelatory reveals what God cares about. Okay, so we do this in the U.S. Laws show you what a people value. So God's creating laws, and from those laws, we can assume that means he values that. And you're going, is that a leap? Let me prove it to you. In the U.S., our laws also reveal what we value. So, for example, we have speed limits. The speed limit on I-75 is way less than when you go out into the hill country and you're on a two-lane road. Okay? Way less. Why? Well, there's common sense involved. And that there's way more cars and way more danger on I-75. But that's because there's, we value people. It's why you can't drive 100 miles an hour down the road because you'll die and you might kill someone else. And we don't want that. We don't want wrecks. We don't want danger. We don't want those things. When you're out in the country, you might hit a deer. That's different. It's why we allow a lot more excessive speeding in places where there are fewer people because the value is on people. Let me give you an even more um, intense example of that. School zones. We as a society have decided that children are more vulnerable and therefore should be protected with greater degrees of safety. We know this because you cannot speed in school zones. It's lower speed limit than it is on the road when you're not in a school zone. And if you've ever gotten a ticket in a school zone, what do you know? I mean, the fee is much higher right? It's an enforcement to say, listen, we are so serious about caring for the vulnerable. And the vulnerable in this situation, when it comes to speed laws, are children who sometimes run in the road because they don't know any better. They kick a soccer ball and they step into the road. And that is dangerous. And because we value our children, we're going to make you go from 35 down to 25. And because we value our kids so much, we're going to put cops there. And if you are going 27, buddy, that's 500 bucks or however much it costs. I don't know. I 
I've been pulled over in a school zone, but I didn't get a ticket. Um, but I do know it's more expensive, right? We also have laws about intoxication. You think to yourself, you know, we have laws that say you have to value others. It's why you can't get crazy drunk and drive down the road because you might hit someone else. We have laws about these things in place, right? So it shows you that we value human life. But I'm not trying to sit here and say that the United States is a beacon of great and wonderful laws because in a negative example, so this tells you a positive example. We value human life more than cows, which is good. Um, in our speeding laws, we do. I'm not going to say that's a universal blanket statement. It should be, but maybe we don't. Um, and then... And then we value the more vulnerable children by having slower speed laws and greater fines. How does this, now that's a, so that's a positive example. I think that's a good thing. We should definitely have those speed laws. And you shouldn't speed in school zones. My goodness, kids are precious. Oh, they're the future. Okay, this is where the U.S. has a negative example. Our prostitution laws are extremely harsh towards the prostitute and exceedingly soft towards the person who solicits the prostitute. Okay. Who does that show is valued more? We slam down on these women who, by the way, no woman wakes up and says, I want to be a prostitute. These are women who have often been trafficked. They have been sexually abused. They're often caught um, and being used by a pimp. They have no way out. And, and then the laws, if you solicit a prostitute, is a slap on the wrist. It's almost nothing. Sometimes you just get a fine. Who gets charged? Who gets prostituted? It shows us what it reveals. Now, men... I'm not talking to you specifically unless you happen to write these law books, but I'll tell you, this is part of why when RBG says women should be in every room where decisions are being made, the reality is, is those laws that protect the men and harm the women prostitutes, or at least more harshly harm the women prostitutes, were written by men, okay? The more powerful businessman, did you know the number one day for prostitution, the number one day for prostitution in the United States is on a Monday. Do you want to know why? Because we know that these men, and it's predominantly men, so I'm just going to use a blanket statement, have been home with their wives and their children on Saturday and Sunday, and so they often solicit a prostitute on Monday. Okay? These are facts that we have. This is just These are just stone-cold facts that you can look up. So the same men who solicit prostitutes can sometimes be the same men who write the laws, which is why then it's much harsher for the prostitute. What if... The laws were a lot softer on the prostitute and a lot harsher on the men who solicited it. I guarantee you we'd see a decrease in prostitution and sex trafficking. I guarantee you we'd see less women and children being sold into sex trafficking because there's no money to be made in it. If if you go after these Johns and really, John being the term for this, you know, not, not, a, anyways, y'all know what I'm saying. This is an example of what is revealed. So it's always good, any society that you're in to say, okay, why is this law here? And who is it protecting? And is that a good law? Because sometimes laws need to be changed. And so that's just a, a free civic lesson for you guys. Okay. So the law is revelatory and regulatory. It's revelatory in that it shows you what you value. The law can show you what's the heart behind it. What, who is it trying to protect? Who is it trying to care for? We see that in speeding laws. We see that in prostitution laws. The other thing is, is um, you have to come at the law, the ancient law, understanding the difference between case law or sometimes what is called common law versus statutory law. Okay. Statutory law is a law based on statutes. Predominantly, that's American law. And what I mean by that is, um, it, we'll go back to the speeding example. There is a statute that says the speed limit is 50. There are then statutes that say if you drive above 50, if you go five above, you pay 100 bucks. If you go 15 above, you pay 150 bucks. If you go 30 above, you get in the back of the cop car and it's a misdemeanor, right? There are, and, and the police officer doesn't get to decide, well, I mean, wink, wink, but he doesn't get to decide what fine you pay. The judge doesn't get to decide what fine you pay. It is a, if, if everything's reported factually, it is, here was the statute, the, it, the statement, the law says 50 miles an hour, you were going 150 miles an hour, therefore, your consequence is, boom, it's already in the law. That's called statutory law. It is basically how America works. We have statutes for everything. It's why our law code is excessive and very difficult to understand. And it's oftentimes why laws are appealed to higher courts because sometimes we don't have a statute and then after the case is decided, then we have a new statute. Americans love statute laws. This is what the law says. You broke the law. Here's the consequence for it. It's this fine. It's this whatever. There is, of course, wiggle room. I'm not saying that everything in American law is statute law, but, but that's how we tend to understand the law. And it's how we tend to understand the biblical law. 
Okay, and what I mean by that is we put our finger on and go, at chapter and verse, that's what it says. If the Bible says no divorces, no divorces, and that's it. However, the ancient laws, the ancient Near East function, we know this from lots of examples, and I'm going to show you this, is that it often function on case law, okay? And what that means is it is sort of like, hey, there are these laws and there's different ways that the case can be handled and there's a wisdom to follow a just principle is behind the law and it's in it's the job of the judges to follow these just principles but each law is going to be different and they don't follow the stitch statute law for, like according to every jot and tittle but instead the laws often followed cases and said, okay, what's going on in this case? What is there precedent? What has God said about it? God will not speak exhaustively about it, but when God speaks, he's given us a, a wisdom principle to follow. And it's our job as the people of God and people who want to be just like God to follow that wisdom principle. Okay. Here's what I mean by that. I'm going to read to you this quote um, from a guy who studies wisdom law. He says, the Hebrew Bible strongly suggests that the earliest forms of disputes were resolved by intuitions of justice against a background of custom rather than appeal to formulated rules. Okay? So I'm going to make you understand that. The earliest forms of disputes were solved by intuitions of justice rather than formulated rules. The biblical sources which talk about the establishment of the judicial system in Israel give no indication that judges were to use written sources. In other words, there's no law book. Deborah and Samson, all these judges didn't walk around with like a law book for the purpose of saying, okay, Article 7.2, blah, blah, blah. What did he do? Mm, he rode his camel that fast in the school zone in ancient Israel? Okay, 15 shekel fine. Like there's no, that's not, we have no evidence of that's what's happening. Um, and rather, judges are urged to avoid partiality and corruption and to do justice. But what was the source of such justice? The version attributed to King Jehoshaphat is the most explicit. God is with you in giving judgment. In other words, a relationship with God means that you appeal to God and his understanding of justice for the way that you make decisions. Divine inspiration is also attributed to the king in rendering judgment. Proverbs 16.10 says, Inspired decisions are on the lips of a king. His mouth does not sin in judgment. Solomon's judgment in 1 Kings 3, 16 through 28 is presented as an example of just such a process. And just to remind you of that, two moms come to Solomon. Um, both of the, uh, one of, Two moms have both had a baby. A baby dies. So there's one baby left. And both moms are claiming it's their baby. And so Solomon, rather than appealing to, you know, possessions nine-tenths of the law, or, well, this is what the law says, or whatever, he says, okay, I'm going to cut the baby in half, and you each can have a half a baby. And the one mom says, oh, sounds good. And the other mom goes, oh, my gosh, no. Just, she can have the baby. And, John, and then Jonathan, wow. Solomon then rightly says, okay, the mom who says you can have the baby is the real mom because she doesn't want anything bad to happen to her baby. She'd rather her baby be alive, living with the other woman, than her baby be dead. That is an, that is an example of wisdom and judgment being upheld in the biblical law as this is what God expects of you, okay? So this is not to say that judges were expected to go into some kind of trance or function as an oracle. Rather, they were called to operate by, by, by combining local custom with divinely guided intuitions of justice, relying on the practical wisdom that existed within the social consciousness of the people as a whole. Okay, it was a lot of words. But what what Bernard Jackson is saying from his wisdom law books and what, he's, and what so many ancient Near Eastern law scholars are saying is that yes, you have law codes. And what those law codes are designed to do is to give you an idea of what justice looks like. But when a judge is going to render, it is expected that they understand and intuit justice because they know the wisdom already and that they would make decisions based on that. We have all this example of the Code of Hammurabi, which is this massive ancient Near Eastern code, one of the most famous ones that's still intact. Also, sometime you should ask Alex about it. It's in the Louvre, and I did not know that. And we went to Paris last year for New Year's. I did not know this. So we went and saw the Mona Lisa. We saw the Nike statue there, Nike of Samothrace, which was super dope. I've always wanted to see it. And then Alex says, where do you want to go next? And I said, what if we went down to the antiquity section? I hear they have mummies. So we start walking down the antiquity section. 
Y'all, to say that I geeked out about the Kota Hammurabi may be an understatement, but I don't think I was. But the way Alex tells the story is that I was like a giddy schoolgirl bouncing around the antiquity section of the Louvre trying to explain to her about the Code of Hammurabi. Okay, so that's my long window of saying it's a really amazing code. The code says things like, if you kill your neighbor's cow, you owe him 500 Mesopotamian units of money, okay? We have all these, like, documents that decide court cases from the ancient Near East. And some say 350, some say 1,000, some say whatever. And, and so in American understanding of law, we'd go, okay, you kill your cow, it's worth 500. People that were applying the code of Hammurabi, people who were trying to intuit the idea of justice, is saying, not every cow is worth 500. What if it's old Bessie, who's like 90 years old, and she's about to fall over, and she's the cow who dies? She's not worth 500. So you're going to get 50. But what if it's a prize cow that's really healthy and it was pregnant and it was going to have twins? Like, I don't know if they would have known that, but you know what I'm saying? Like, we have no, we don't have any examples in the ancient world of somebody kind of going, hey, chapter and verse of the scroll from God, that's the law you violated and here's how you fix it, okay? So when you're reading the law and then when you see other people in the Bible uh, applying the law, they often do it a little bit differently than we do as Americans. And I think it's important that we understand that because sometimes I think we treat the law in a way that nobody in the ancient world would treat it. In fact, I know we do. And so, okay. So let me give you an example of how this case law versus statutory law works, okay? Um, I'm going to give you an example in Deuteronomy 22. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And then I'll explain. Just the first half. The second half is about sexual sin. And I'm not going to unpack it for you, but I'm going to encourage you to listen to the Pillar Seminaries podcast on Deuteronomy 22 and the rape laws because the interpretation of the second half of Deuteronomy 22 is often done by people who don't understand the difference between case law and statutory law. And it makes it seem as if God wants women who have been sexually assaulted to live with the men who have been sexually assaulted. And that is not how you should understand the second half of Deuteronomy 22. But we're going to jump into the first half. So, okay, and I'm just going to give you an example of how, what not to do, okay? So, for example, it says, You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you, you do not know who he is, you shall bring it home to your house. And it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. And you shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment or with any lost thing in your brother's which he loses and you find. You may not ignore it. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him lift him up again. Okay. So here's the law. You're walking down the road and you see some oxen walking down the road and you're like, hmm. It's not my problem. And God's like, oh, no. <laughs> no, it is your problem. That's your problem. You saw it. So that's the first thing, right? So a natural person would ask, okay, uh, then what am I supposed to do? And God answers the question. He goes, oh, okay, you need to return it to your brother. Well, the law could end there, but then you expect a natural conclusion or Nick's follow-up question is, okay, but what if I don't know who it is? And then you go, okay, that's a great question. Then take the oxen home and just hold on to it. Next question, for how long? Well, until, listen, it's an ancient world. The oxen's pretty expensive. Somebody's going to go looking for that oxen. Okay, um, what if it's not an oxen? What if it's a donkey? Great question. Same rule applies. If it's a donkey, if it's a garment, if it's whatever, you have to take it home. Okay, and so this is how case law works. Is It's presenting the first part of the case. You see it, you're walking down the road, you see an oxen walking down the road, it is your responsibility. Then you expect the questioner to go, okay, but what if I, okay, so you, okay, so the law is, if you see an oxen walking down the road, return it to whoever's oxen it belongs to. The, the natural question is, what if I can't do that? Am I off the hook? Nope, you're not off the hook. You got to take it home. Okay, but how do I take it home until they come find it? Okay, but what if it was an oxen? Ha ha, got you there. If it's a donkey, if it's a garment, if it is whatever, it's your responsibility. So if somebody in court, okay, came and said, hey, I was walking down the road. Um, I heard something in, in the brush. I heard something in the brush, uh, but I didn't look. I didn't look. 
I didn't want to look because I didn't know what it was. So I kept my eyes averted from it and I kept walking down the road. And then later I heard that my neighbor Phil's cow was stuck in the ditch, but it's not my responsibility to help him because I didn't look. If you're, do, if you're trying this case by statutory law, you might have a case. You might have a case. It doesn't say. It doesn't say what if you don't see it. It's, it explicitly says in the law, if you see it, you're responsible. But what's the heart of the law? <laughs> the heart of the law is God's telling you, listen, we're all neighbors here. And it's expected that if somebody has something valuable or something they care about and it's out and it's vulnerable, you, you are your brother's keeper. That's the heart of the law. So no person who is trying this as case law would go, oh, okay, there's a loophole here. No, they'd go, you heard something rustling in the ditch and you thought be, you could just plug your ears and walk on by and you wouldn't be held accountable? Like, no, you're absolutely held accountable to that, okay? So this is how case law works. It's sort of like there's a principle and then there's follow-up questions. Well, what if, what, okay, so like giving some, like if you're, if an oxen gores your neighbor, um, then you have to pay a penalty or, or whatever. And then the next question is, okay, but what if I knew my oxen was dangerous? And they're like, okay, then you're accountable to murder, right? There's, there's accidents and then there's murder. And what the law does is it starts answering these objections, but there's no loophole to be found. It's not like you can go and be like, oh, well, the heart behind this is, um, you had to have seen the animal and then you're fine. No. Common law says, what is the heart here? The heart in the beginning of Deuteronomy 22 is very obviously, you have to care for your neighbor's stuff. Like it's your own. That's the heart behind it, okay? And so that's how common law plays itself out. Okay, so that's the background information. You've got regulatory, revelatory. You've got case law. um, You've got, you know, God is showing himself what he cares about in these laws. So what are in these laws? How are these laws just? First thing. Is there a special care for the vulnerable in these laws? Okay, when you go back, and I told you, the laws show you what, or they reveal what you care about. And I used the example of speeding, and I said, listen, we value our children. So that if you're speeding in a school zone, that is a bigger problem than if you're just flying down the road in wherever, out in the, out in the country, okay? Because we value the vulnerable. When you look at God's law, special care and consideration is made for the vulnerable. Specifically, you will hear widow, orphan, foreigner, and poor, or you'll hear it like widow and the fatherless. Um, Foreigner is sometimes translated stranger, and poor and widow are typically translated widow and poor. Um, They are mentioned often. Now, does that mean that God prefers that class of people? No, no, that's not the point. The point is, is those four people, the widow, orphan, the poor, and the foreigner, they are more likely to suffer harm. They are more likely to suffer injustice because they are the most vulnerable in the society is why God is giving them special attention. God is saying in my law, I care for the most vulnerable. Those who are not vulnerable don't need special laws. They're fine. They own their land. They have their food. They have a good job. They don't need special laws. They're the laws that of course care for them. And and if they're harmed, I absolutely care for that. But these four people, They are especially vulnerable, which is why I'm going to talk about them all the time, okay? So one of my favorite passages is Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 22. This is one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Um, It says, hey, when you're, uh, let's say you have a field, you have a big old field of grapes or wheat or whatever. It says, do not glean all the way to the ends of your field. Leave the corners. Now, if it was statutory law, it would need to say, leave 4.7 cubic blah, 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 blah. in the corners, da, 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 right? Or if it was such, or if we didn't understand what this law meant, if we didn't understand the heart behind this law, some people might leave the corner of their lawns unmowed, right? They may not understand the heart behind it. The heart behind this law is so that those without land, namely the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, and the poor, have the chance to glean and have food and provision. God is saying in his law, do not glean all of your food, but leave some. And he doesn't say how much. Right? He doesn't. And I think the reason for that is if you've got a smaller field and your family is is not as wealthy, you may not leave as much for those groups. But if you have a big old field, you need to be leaving a whole lot more. I think God, the heart behind this is to say, be generous. 
towards the most vulnerable and your generosity is going to show up in you leaving your crop so that these people can have a place to work safely and have provision for their daily needs. We see this example show up in the book of Ruth. If you remember, Ruth and Naomi go back and she goes to Boaz's field and Boaz even tells his workers, leave some bigger heads of grain for her, right? We see Boaz, like the generosity, it talks about how much, I don't remember how much barley it was, but it was a lot. Like, and so much so that when Ruth comes home, Naomi sees it and she's like, okay, that ain't normal. That, that is from someone being exceptionally generous. That's from Boaz. Oh, Boaz has a little soft eye to you, right? So this is how we see that play out. There is special care. What, who does God value? It's not that he values them more. It's just that the law reveals that the vulnerable need special care taken to protect them. The second thing about special care for the vulnerable, debts are to be forgiven throughout time so that you can prevent generational poverty. The people of Israel are a, a tribe, right? They're one big tribe of people and they have, they have an allotment of land, each person, down to each person's family. Um, through drought, through foolishness, through maybe, you know, something out of control like a drought or a fire or theft or who knows, who knows? People fall on hard times. And because of that, there's provision for that. You can sell your field to someone else. You can sell yourself into slavery to them. You can um, come up with some sort of agreement to work it off. But then throughout the law, God says, listen, Every so few years, every seven years, and then in the year of Jubilee, you forgive debts. Why? Because it's not, you're not meant to be in generational poverty. We are meant to have provision so that people can be freed from poverty. It's never supposed to be something that marks them all the days of their life. In fact, God says, you should never have any poor among you. How can you say that? You can say that if your law has special provision in order to make that a reality. Okay, so special care for the vulnerable. You look out for those four people mentioned. Debts are meant to be forgiven. And fair judgment is expected. And we talked about this before of like what is expected in case law. It says do not show partiality to the powerful and to the rich. This is what's said to the judges outright and to the kings. Like be fair. Why? Because it's like today, right? I mean, you hear about these cases, right? You hear about, you know, let's say it's like, copyright infringement laws or I don't know something like that and you have this you have Nike okay oh we'll use me as an example Nike this is completely fictional but let's say I decide to start my own brand of sports bottles okay and I decide that they're going to be named after me because why wouldn't I right so they're Nike sports bottles there's a good chance Nike would not like that you know I know because Nike never let me put my shoes on my name on my own shoes when they had that Nike ID program okay they didn't let me put my own name on my shoes how neither Nike nor Spalding okay because Spalding's another sports brand and Nike was apparently too close so let's say I start my own company my name is Nike and I use my own likeness. It's my face on the bottle. And one day somebody from Nike comes along and goes, did you hear about this little mom and pop shop in Dallas? Mom and cat shop in Dallas. Um, she's making these Nike sports bottles, or Nike sports bottles. But frankly, mm, it's too close to Nike. You know what Nike's going to do? You know what they're going to do? They're going to get some high-powered lawyers to come down here and bully me out of my product. And I'm going to have the choice to either fight them in court with very little money from my up-and-coming sports bottle program against their 15 lawyers that they have on retainer because that's what the powerful can do. God is like, no, 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 no. You need to judge fairly. It's not my fault I'm born with this name. It's not my fault I want to, you know. And so how would you judge fairly is something that God creates in his laws. The other thing that we see about justice is restitution is required when laws are broken. So when you go back all the way back to the first week and we talk about justice and righteousness, righteousness is right relationship, that there's equity in relationship. When there's inequity, because maybe somebody wronged somebody or stole from somebody or whatever, justice is the means by which we restore that righteousness, that we restore those relationships. That is what we see throughout the scriptures, okay? That restitution, hey, you killed someone's oxen, you got to replace that oxen. You, you know, whatever, you, uh, you can't afford to pay back your debt, okay? You can work it off in indebted, indebtment, into indebted slavery. In that, what the goal is, is let's say there's inequity here. 
the law does not allow for this person to do this and then push them down, okay? Instead, the law is always bringing restraint. So if I kill your $500 oxen, it is not the word of God that would say it's okay for me to then charge you 5000 or if somebody gets 5000 right? The idea is what, what is the oxen worth? What, like what is the, so restraint is often required in this application of justice and equity and relational restoration is the goal. Why does God care about the oxen? Is it just the money? No. Okay. It's not, it's not just the money. The reality is, is if you live as neighbors, right? If you, if you live in close proximity to each other and I harm you, whether intentionally or unintentionally, there's friction there. And they're meant to live at, at peace with each other. The psalmist declares, uh, blessed is it when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It is like oil on the beard of Aaron is like oil dripping down. That relationships and, and shalom, peace is the goal. We want shalom in the kingdom of God. And if you come to my house, we have a party, we come to my house and you steal five of my books, I'm going to be a little annoyed right? And there's a couple of ways to make that right. You bring me my books back. I want my books back. But let's say you're like, I not only took your books, I kind of, I burned them. I'm gonna be like, that's annoying. Is it the, is it the 50 bucks or however much bucks in books? No, you broke trust. (laughs) I'm not gonna let you in my house again, right? Or I'm certainly not without checking your bag before you leave or I don't know, whatever. These are getting weirder by the second. But my point being, it's always about restoration of relationship. It's not about the money. It, it is about the money, but the money became, becomes a means by which you bring about restoration. And it's assumed that forgiveness will be a part of that transaction so that there can be a return to wholeness between neighbors, between brothers and sisters. Um, just laws also, what we see is the laws are also designed for a relationship with God. So the laws are not just about how do neighbors live together in unity It is also how do we have a right relationship with the one true God, with Yahweh? We are big fat sinners. We know that. So God makes provision in his law to say, this is what atonement looks like until my son comes and makes the final atonement, until my son comes and makes everything right. Leviticus 16, the day of atonement, it is this massive, massive Jewish day in their history where the high priest comes in and makes atonement on behalf of the people. Okay, so part of the justice is not just justice on this level of humans, but it's also here. It's where we get a foreshadowing. The Day of Atonement is a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do in finality for us. That not only is there injustice between man and man, but there is injustice between man and Yahweh, man and God. And God shows us there is, this is a foretaste. Like the laws are an echo, like they're like, they're like, hey, just wait until you see him do it, like finally, right? And so it is, it is teaching the people that when you transgress the law, you're not just harming yourself and others, but you're harming your relationship with God. And by the way, when one member of the community does it, the whole community suffers, okay? The whole community suffers. And God is teaching them how they're interconnected to each other and to him. And he does that in the law. He's showing them what justice is going to look like as a community and as worshipers of Yahweh. That was a dumb one. Um, where am I going with this? Oh, okay. I wanted to, I think this will be fun for you guys. I'm actually not going to be on the Zoom on Tuesday. Austin's going to lead that Zoom. Um, I'm taking a vacation. So just um, for those of y'all been tracking, it's been a hard hard week. And, um, so I'm going to take, I'm going to take a week and I'm going to go to Colorado. But that being said, I wanted to read Leviticus 19 because I think this would be a really great thing for you guys to do together on the zoom. And I, so after all that I've just taught you, okay. So the law is regulatory and revelatory. It's, it's, um, uh, common law, it's code law. It's not statutory law. And it's always like, who is God protecting? Who, what is it revealing? What does God care about? Um, I thought it'd be really fun to read Leviticus 19, one through, I think I go all the way through 11. You should read the whole chapter. It's a great chapter. And I just think it'd be great assignment for all of us to just begin to jot down. What do we learn about who God values, what God values, 
What is God saying in these laws? And then, like, what are modern day applications? And so that's what I'm going to say. Austin can lead the discussion however he wants. Austin, if you're listening to me now, I'm petitioning you to have everybody come ready to answer the questions. What do we learn about God? What do we learn about what God values? And how can we apply that? What would an application of that look like today? But do whatever you want. The teacher will be gone. Okay. I'm just going to read Leviticus 19 here. And so it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. When you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it or on the day after, and anything left over until the third day shall be burned up with fire. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is tainted. It will not be accepted. And everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned what is holy to the Lord and that person shall be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner, I am the Lord your God. Uh, I think you know how to handle that passage. Um, you shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, so that profane the name of your Lord God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Okay. Again, I think it'd be awesome for you guys to read this and go, okay, what is God revealing? Who does God care about? Who's especially protected here? Um, and then what would be modern day applications of that? Because I, I don't think we take the law seriously. And I think we did. Um, our cities would look a little different. I just think that. I just think they would. But that's not my job. That's Austin's job. Okay, so what's the so what for us? What is what is what are we getting at here? Um, if justice and righteousness are about equity, okay. So if it's about okay. So if if again righteousness is equity in relationships, regardless of class, gender, socioeconomic status, citizenship status, um, sexuality. Uh, whatever college football team you root for or disabilities you have or it doesn't matter. Okay, this is righteousness. And this can be between man and man and this can be between God and man, that there's no enmity here, right? Justice then, again, are the steps that we take, okay? If, If the goal is this, then special care should be made for those who are more likely to be treated unfairly. Like, we need to be (laughs) brutally honest about how the world really works, okay? Like, we we don't even have to grow up to understand this, okay? So, um, we all know, right? We all know that if a kid is born with maybe a disability, that there's a good chance they're going to get picked on. We know, we know that if a kid is, is born, you know deaf or blind he or she's gonna have a harder time in school right than people who have who have you know normal vision and normal hearing and we we know then that we have to take special considerations in those cases right we know this we know that even kids can be unbelievably cruel sometimes because they don't even understand the weight of what they're saying they don't their frontal lobes aren't developed this continues on even after right so the poor, like there, if you haven't done the poverty experience, I know PCPC does it from time, par, um, excuse me for those who aren't, uh, Park City's Presbyterian Church, other places do it. Like it is, it is really hard to be poor. And I don't just mean this like, because duh, like the reality is, is we often make hurdles in our society more difficult for those who are poor. We just do. We know society wise that uh, 13% or really it's 6%, because 6%, 13% of the population is black, so 6% of the population in America is black men. 6%. And they account for 40% of deaths at the hand of police. Right? So what if we wrote laws around this? 
What if we said, hey, let's just be really honest about what it means to be human and in our depravity, that there are people who are more vulnerable. And because they're more vulnerable, and by the way, God's like, hey, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, and the poor, what classes would you say in America are those people? Which maybe that's a good assignment. How then can we make sure that if this is the goal and they're starting here, how do we then bring them here? And it's, I don't think it's socialism or communism or a handout or welfare. I think it's biblical to ask, are there classes of people in America who we know it's going to be harder on them? How can we then create a more just society to say this is how we even the playing field and prevent the very things that God was trying to prevent in his law? Um, secondly, God really cares about relationships. He really cares, right? Okay, so this is um, Emily Fierre, who, who with Allison Reedus helps lead our children ministry. We were talking one day about, you know, teaching kids to not lie. And she was like, you shouldn't lie. And the question is, well, why? And she says, you know, sometimes people can say things like, well, because the Bible says so, which is true, which is true. Why does the Bible say so? Why does God not want us to bear false witness? One, because if you're bearing false witness in a court case, now you're being unjust. But two, because if you lie, you break trust. And if you break trust, you break relationship. And if you break relationship, you're breaking the things that God really cares about. We are made in the image of a Trinitarian God. We are made in the image of a God who eternally exists, three persons, one essence. That God who eternally existed in relationship, we're made in the image of a relational God. Why are we surprised that his law is all about maintaining right relationships? He really cares about them, not just among ourselves, but among also with him. That's why we have the Day of Atonement, all this stuff. Like God, his law is saying, how do you treat each other? And how do you respond to me so that we can be in relationship with each other? And when you break relationship, I'm going to teach you how to restore it. And it's really important that you do. We have got to be people who say we're sorry And we've got to be people who say, I forgive you. We've got to be people who prioritize relationships and use wisdom to figure out how to maintain them. Because God has already said that it's really, really important. Nick's saying worship is really important and God gets to tell us what is acceptable worship. The law books are a lot of laws about how do you behave, right? Right? There's plenty. This is how you behave. Do this. Don't do this. It's also a lot of this is what an offering needs to look like. This is how the priests are supposed to dress. Here's what the tabernacle is supposed to look like. Here are the days that you need to do this. Like God is meticulous about worship and what it needs to look like and how it needs to be prescribed. What's interesting is we have all these excavations in northern Israel in the city of Dan. And next week I'm going to talk about the prophets, um, uh, justice and the prophets. And what's interesting is God says, hey, your burnt sacrifices need to all come to Jerusalem. It's the only place in the temple. It's the only place that's acceptable. But when the, when the nation splits under Jeroboam and Rehoboam, um, after Solomon dies, so you have King David who has Solomon. Solomon has Jeroboam and Rehoboam, among a lot of other sons. He had a lot of sons. Um, but those two specifically are vying for the crown. They split the kingdom in half. And when they do that, the people in the north were like, well, where are we supposed to give our sacrifices? And what's really interesting is what they should have said is, hey, the only way we're going to be able to give um, an acceptable sacrifice is in Jerusalem, which means we should probably maintain this relationship with our brother in the south. But they don't. And instead, they build their own altar in the city of Dan, which is in northern Israel. And what's really interesting is they have been excavating Dan. And they're finding all this evidence that they did sacrifices unto the Lord, to which God then says in the prophets, I hate them. I hate your feasts. I hate all your feasts in Dan. I hate everything you're doing in northern Israel. Why? Because they're trying to worship God the way they want to worship God. Not the way he said to worship them. Which, I don't know. I'm not a goddess, okay? I don't know. But I think if you're God, and with the breath of your mouth, you created the entire universe and everything in it, and you fashioned us in our mother's wombs and made us bear your image, and you you know, created this shalom place for us and you've given us the land flowing with milk and honey and given us in here and rescued us out of you. Like, I, I don't know, but I think if you're God, 
you get to decide how you're worshipped. But we as humans, we like to decide how God should be worshipped. And I think that might be the most striking thing about the law. Like all this justice stuff really matters. But embedded in that is God is very serious about how he prescribes worship. Now, I'm not saying certain songs are okay, certain songs aren't okay, and all of that. But what I am saying is if God is saying, hey, I delight in mercy, not sacrifice, as part of his his worship experience, maybe some of us in America and all over the world are in danger of only worshiping God with our mouths and, and not with our hearts and not, not in a pure way. I, it's just a sobering reminder and a good check for us to say, I don't think you get to check the box on Sunday. Now, I do think we're moving out. We're becoming a post-Christian nation in some ways in America. Not all the way. Christianity still has a very tight grip here. People calm down. Um, and honestly, I don't think it's a bad thing anyways. Um, so I think fewer people are going to church on Sundays just because. Um, but it's a really good sobering reminder in the word of God that God's like, I decide. And there's really harsh consequences for those who don't do it the way that he describes. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, next thing, uh, last, or next to the last thing, some of the laws are really weird. <laughs> okay. And they are, they are. And so going back to Deuteronomy 22, I read you about the case laws about the oxen and you're the neighbor walking down the road. If you keep reading Deuteronomy 22 is, um, laws about sexual assault and sexual, uh, impropriety. And I believe that that's one of the passages in scriptures that has been most misunderstood. And because of that, it makes God out to be a monster. Because I'm not naive. I know many women who are going to be listening to this and men who are listening to this message have been the victims of sexual assault. And if God's really the kind of God who says, you have to live with the one who assaulted you, um... Man, that'd be a really hard God to worship. And unfortunately, because people don't understand law, uh, they tend to interpret those cases that way because they don't know what's happening. They don't understand the wisdom behind it. Um, I mentioned earlier, the Pillar Seminary is a seminary and they have a podcast and it is, um, let me open this up because I want, if you're wondering how to interpret that passage, I think they do a really good job of it. Um, it is called Sex and Sexual Assault in Deuteronomy 22. It's from October 26, 2018. So Sex and Sexual Assault in Deuteronomy 22 from October 26, 2018. It's the Pillar Seminary. That's their logo. Oh, well, nope. Let me see. Can y'all see that? I'm going to come in sideways. Pillar Seminary. And they handle it really well. Um, so here's what I'd say. If prior to understanding what those guys have to say on that podcast, and you get to parts of the scriptures that are really weird, or maybe even honestly seem cruel, I want to remind you that one, sometimes that's just because we don't know how to interpret it. Sometimes it's because we're in a very different cultural um, place and the people of Israel and I believe God entered into space and time to accommodate to where they're at and call them to a higher standard than uh, where they were currently at so for example there's these laws about if you conquer a land you can take their women to be your wives well in the ancient Near East you could just rape those women and what and what God says is no 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 no, no. you have to give them a time of mourning and you have to marry them which means you have to be in covenant. Now, to us, I'm like, I won't marry anybody if somebody comes and conquers and marries. I'm marrying them. Well, we're not in the ancient Near East. I own my own house here. Like, there's, I believe that if God were to enter into this time and space and give a lot, it'd be like, don't, don't take wives. That would be it. Um, but what do you do with these women who have been left behind in war? His answer is, you care for them. And you give them covenant and you give them a time of mourning. Okay. So my point in all of this is that some of the laws can be really weird and challenging and bizarre. And this is where it, I I have developed what I call just kind of my hermeneutical guidelines. Hermeneutical is just a fancy word for scriptural interpretation. And my guidelines, which means that anytime I'm trying to interpret scripture, if it violates one of these three things, it, it can't be true. Um, and that is this, that God is good and God does good, that God loves me no matter what, 
and that because of the blood of Christ and the spirits indwelling, God is pleased with me. God is good and God does good is a hermeneutical guideline that helps me to when I get to something that I don't understand. And frankly, at first blush, it is um, a difficult place of scripture. This anchor of that God is good and does good reminds me that sometimes it's just because I lack understanding and that God has overwhelmingly earned the benefit of the doubt. Overwhelmingly earned it. Okay. And so that's why I'd say is if you start reading through and you find some weird stuff, some of their laws are real wonky because it has to do with cultic practices. So like going back to the tattoo one and all that stuff, that was because of the weirdness that was going on in the ancient Near East. I don't think God has an opinion about tattoo. I think he has an opinion about a profane tattoo. You know, I think if you were to tattoo on your body, like God isn't real. I think he has an opinion about that um, because he's real and he loves you and he cares for you very much. But I, all that to say, like some of the laws uh, are in there because of the context. Some of them, because of the way that they're translated, are not really at the heart of what it is. And sometimes it's just we got to trust God until we have the ability to fully understand what's in the scriptures. And so if your understanding of a scripture after reading it or somebody teaching it ends up with the idea that God isn't good, then it's our fault. And we need to keep working until we can see God's heart behind all of that. Um, and then lastly, God wants us, wants his people to flourish and he wants us to help each other flourish. These laws, if followed, not today, I mean, it's a very different world. We're not the tribe of Israel and all that. But let's just say if ancient Israel had just done what God said, they'd all be flourishing. There'd be no poor after every seven years. And even if there were poor, they would have food and they would be protected and women wouldn't be harmed. And, and relationships would be restored. Like God is after the flourishing of his people and he has enlisted us in his help. Going back to the Gen- or Deuteronomy 22, you're walking down the road and you see an oxen. And you're like, I love my neighbor enough to go grab Bessie and knock on Frank's door and say, Frank, Bessie got out again, man. Here you go. Like that's flourishing. When you can leave your cloak at the city well, and trust that when you come back and it's not there, then you can ask around and go, oh, you lost. Oh, you know what? I did see. I did see Bertha walking down the road with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's. Yeah, you're right. The house at the end. Yeah. Go and the bread. Oh, this is your cloak. Here's your cloak. Like that. She didn't cut it in strips and use it as hair ties. Right. I mean, like that is a flourishing way to live. Now. We're sinners. Right. That's why Jesus has to come. We can't live up to this. The law was our tutor and it failed us and we failed it. And Jesus comes and he fulfills it. Every last bit of it. And thanks be to God for that. But the principle that God is still after our flourishing and the day is coming when we will flourish in the kingdom of heaven is still so true and good and right. And so we should seek the flourishing of those around us. Because it's in accordance with the good, just law of God. And it's whispers of what is to come. Um, and then finally, I think this is obvious, but I'm just going to say it. Care for the vulnerable around you. Find out who's vulnerable and care for them. Even if they're vulnerable because of their own stupidity. God does not make that clarification. Care for the vulnerable around you. All right. That is justice in the law, as usual. It's not exhaustive, couldn't even possibly be, but um, it's just another piece of this justice puzzle that God is sewing together for us to show us that he absolutely cares about justice, and it jumps off the pages in the law section. So if nobody's told you today that they love you, I do, but way more importantly, God does. I might jump on on Tuesday just to listen in, but uh, Professor Carver will be taking over for me, and so um, love you all, and... We will move on to Justice and the Prophets, which frankly will probably just teach itself. I could just tell you to read the Prophets and you'll see it jump off the pages, but um, we'll come up with something fun. All right. Grace and peace, friends.